So I just wanted to start by saying, um, I've always wondered what was special about the year I was born, because I was born in 1971. And last month in Peterborough, I found out at Stomping Tom Connor's funeral memorial service that he, um, 1971 is his year because he sold out the Horseshoe Tavern in Toronto six weeks in a row. So that made me feel special. But also, just yesterday I learned that the Endangered Species Act started in 1971. So that made me feel even more special. And the first conference was held on my birthday, which was yesterday. So I thought that was cool too. <laughs> Okay, so now we're gonna talk about road ecology and endangered species and um, innovation, using innovation and stewardship to have recovery for the endangered species. We all know roads are a threat for many endangered species and we need these tools to help the situation. So in Ontario, from what I've seen, I think that the reptiles are the hardest hit. And I apologize, I'm not sure whose picture this is, so if it's anybody's out there, could they please let me know so I can credit them? This picture was taken by Don Scallon. It, uh, he's a teacher, and he found eight Blandings turtles on one event, um, road killed on Highway 24 in Brantford, and the Ontario Road Ecology Group was working at the Toronto Zoo and uh, adopt a pond, got involved, and later there was some mitigation for these animals, and we'll, I'll go into that further in the presentation. So, turtles still, still exist all over the landscape, although the biodiversity of the turtles is not as common as it used to be. You have isolated populations, and there's also only sometimes one or two species found in a grid square. So this shows Ontario Nature data um, of presence, absence of Blanding's turtles. And you can see where they have to exist in the landscape with all these roads. And that's the land between. And there you can see that there's a stronghold of turtles in that area. And it's also an area that doesn't have as many roads. So that would be a key area to invest in mitigation as more development roads occurs in the area. Snakes are also hard, hit hard by roads. And they suffer the same problem. So there's 17 species. 10 of them are species at risk. Eight of them are impacted by roads. Again, we're having a dive biodiversity issue with the presence of snakes across the landscape. Quite often it's only common species found today and there's very few hot spots where all the species at risk, snakes, occur together. The Bruce is one hot spot for snakes and snake mortality. So I just wanted to point out this one study to illustrate that. Uh, Tricia Stinenson is doing her masters up there and in one year those are the species at risk, endangered threatened snakes that she found in the area, and that's something definitely that would need to be looked at as far as a mitigation perspective and conservation perspective. So then, of course, we have endangered amphibians, and these are also impacted by roads, and also one skink, and these populations are very rare, so we need to start looking at some recovery efforts for the road threats. So there's also a lot of other endangered species in Ontario that are impacted by roads, and there's not very much information on them. There's the monarch butterfly. If you do a Google search, you'll find hardly anything about it with regards to roads. There was one study in Illinois, and I would like to know, I've always wondered how many monarchs are dying on the 401 during their migration. Mammals, American Badger won report by Savanta in this region. And birds, we don't know anything about whippoorwills. We know they're impacted by roads, say hunt on roads at night, but we need to know what are the impacts of roads on these animals. So there's a lot of research and science that we still need. And of course, plants. We've heard a lot about endangered plants and roads and transplant, transplanting them in this conference. 
So of course, then there's also the human impacts. Our population growth is exponential growing. With that comes roads. And we like to live where all these species at risk like to live. And we like to drive cars. Alone. <laughs> we need to carpool. Anyway, so another big issue is fragmentation. This is the 401, which crosses the landscape. And this is harder to measure or harder to understand, but it's definitely a huge concern, especially with climate change. As the animals move from the south to the north, they have to cross the 401. We have a lot of mitigation that we need to catch up on with these roads. Superhighways are going in to accommodate population growth. And along with those superhighways is also a current municipal network and provincial roads, and we have a situation where there's no point on the landscape more than 1.5 kilometers from a road, unless you're in the middle of Lake Simcoe. So there's a lot of piecemeal mitigation efforts, um, project-related through HSP, MNR funds, and we're trying, and we're trying to get the volunteers and research and everything going on and use the BIS mitigation across the landscape. These are some examples of those types of mitigation level projects. Um, the road closure, we heard about that on King Road. Point Pili has put seasonal signs up for snakes. Um, Kilbear Provincial Park has a Massasauga tunnel that they're going to monitor as part of a MSC research project. There's Massasauga rattlesnake fence in the bottom middle there. That's on Highway 69. That was a lot of this, that one in particular was put up, I think, as an overall benefit permit with the Endangered Species Act. So a lot of these things come out through that overall benefit process, which is a good thing for a road ecologist. So just an example to show a quick case study to show how we have a toolbox of mitigation measures, but we need to implement them properly. We need guidelines, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit more, but this is a perfect example. We've had turtle crossing signs go up across the landscape for the last, I think, 20 years by different agencies. So you, I was, when I moved here, I came here in 2007. I, always, I was wondering, who's putting these signs up and where are they and why are they put where they're put? So through a um, highway innovation funding program grant from the MTO, we want to look at where these signs were placed because the MTO wants to place endangered species signs on their roads. So we thought we could use it as a case study. So there's 336 signs that were GPSed on the landscape. And the first problem was none of these signs were inventoried by the people that had actually put them up. There was no database where these signs were, not by the municipalities, not the NGOs sometimes had a small Excel sheet or a couple emails, but no coordinated data management system inventory for these signs. And I found that strange because every other sign is inventoried on our roads. So that just sends a message. We need to put some more resources and confidence in what we're doing. So we found that a lot of these signs are stolen. So inventory would help to be able to place the signs, put them back. Maybe eventually the, th the thieves will peter out and stop st stealing them in an area. But we just don't know because we don't monitor them. So there was 11, I found, we found 11 different signs across the landscape. Um, snake, a couple snake signs as well. And that, just shows that's good and bad because they're catchy and they might send a, a message to more people with different signs, but at the same time, it's showing that people are not working together and there is not one go-to place for a sign, although the Toronto Zoo is trying to adopt that kind of strategy at this point. Um, you can see the Toronto Zoo sign with the tortoise in the bottom right there. So anyway, so the whole point is that we just need more information to know whether these strategies are working. Um, we looked at where they were placed. Um, with the Ontario Road Ecology Group, we had devised a landscape-based model that depicted where turtles 
road mortality hotspots occurred across the entire MNR um, mapped roaded landscape of southern Ontario. It turned out that it was 19,000 kilometers of road was a hotspot, and this was validated, so it gives us a baseline of what we're working with. It makes sense to have these signs used because if you're looking at a widespread phenomena, then this would be at least a, a strategy that could start get people thinking about putting mitigation up, and they could be act as markers where perhaps more permanent mitigation will occur later. So we found that 13% of the signs that were up of those 336 that we GPSed were actually not in those hotspots depicted by that map. So that's 13% of signs possibly, most likely, in not necessarily the wrong spot, but not the best spot. So we also found that a lot of the signs were on local streets, which might be good if your objective is um, to impact a couple people in that community, but if it's just one snapping turtle on that local road, it might not be the best bang for your buck. Also, a lot of the signs were on paved, not paved roads where it's um, intuitive that the higher traffic volumes, more turtle mortality were occurring. They were on gravel roads. Sometimes these gravel roads were dead ends and, you know, traffic volumes are low. So is that the best bang for your buck? So that is just a good example of the coordination that we need in this province to have effective road mitigation for a huge problem. Road mortality for endangered species is huge. So these are the kind of the things, as I was asked to come and present, uh, um, what I thought could help the situation. So I'm just going to go through each one of them for the remainder of the presentation. And we'll start with policy why we're here today, to talk about the Endangered Species Act. Now this policy, as I said, with the overall benefit permit, a lot of times we have a road mitigation toolbox that we use for, if the road's gonna go through, we can use this toolbox to better the situation. Um, Environmental Assessment Act is another piece of legislation where we can get road mitigation thought about, consulted, work together with different disciplines and Actually, with road ecology, we, there's so much learning to be done w between disciplines that this act is really important just to teach the practitioners about what is available. Provincial policy statement, natural heritage systems all across southern Ontario at different um, scales, regions, jurisdictions, watershed level, municipal level, provincial level, these are great maps, we already have the maps, all we have to do is overlay roads, and then we can try and figure out, okay, where is the mitigation going to be needed if a road does go there? So, as I said earlier, that's the policy. Um, we, can, we need communication and coordination. It's a no-brainer. A lot of people have been talking about this throughout the conference. So, there is a lot of examples of this in this province, and the Toronto Zoo championed it in 2005, 2007, when I came over as a keynote speaker. And then soon after that, the Ontario Road Ecology Group started. And that started as a result of the MNR Species at Risk grant that we won. And myself and Dave Ireland and Amelia Argue worked really hard with that grant to get this group off the ground. And after that, the group has put together that road mortality hotspot map that I told you about, and we are continue validating that with more road mortality data and ongoing annual workshops and communicating through listservs. And this is a huge help to the situation. So monitoring. Monitoring is, can be interpreted in many ways. In this, in this case, Monitoring here, we're talking about monitoring the landscape for road mortality so we can measure the impacts of roadkill on these species, especially endangered species. They're rare. You don't find large sample sizes of endangered species dead on the road. So you have to know where these are occurring to build models to be able to extrapolate it to areas where they're gone and you might want to mitigate for restoration opportunities. So we monitor. Um, Every year, a circuit in eastern Ontario where we found over 50 species at risk, snakes and turtles, 
and amphibians, um, mink frog, over the last four years. So we can continue to monitor and look at trends, see if the increases, decreases, weather, changes with the weather, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of monitoring is needed across the landscape. So we need volunteers, we need coordination, we need people doing it, and a lot of people contribute their data to Ontario Reptile and Amphibian Atlas, which is good as well. So there's this second type of monitoring, which is monitoring road mitigation so that we know whether it works or not. There's so, it's such a new science, it's only been around for 30 years, so we just don't know what's best for what species and which context and which landscape with what road. So all these things have to be monitored. And this, as we know, we've heard in this conference, that can be expensive, but it needs to be done. So in this case, you can see that that's a Reconyx camera on that post there. Reconyx cameras are um, infrared technology that road ecologists use, wildlife biologists use to monitor, how much time? Two minutes? Okay, I gotta hurry. <laughs> so um, anyway, so the Reconyx camera is okay for monitoring. But for amphibians and smaller animals, we need better technology. We need people to devise good systems for monitoring. So this is an example of Long Point Causeway, where the environmental assessment that was done there provided opportunity to teach and coordinate among several disciplines. And we were also able to get different types of culverts placed in the road for the first phase of mitigation because there was massive prolonged turtle road mortality, snake, endangered species mortality, we've all heard about it. So this pr provides a very good opportunity to, to look at what turtles prefer to use as far as a design when they're crossing the road. Just an, another note that I should bring out with that one is the, um, you saw the tunnel with the holes in it. I'm just also wondering, in this province, everybody talks about openness ratios, engineers like it. That, tunnel on the left, the Yakko Wildlife Tunnel, is one-fifth the cost of the larger one, has less openness, less light, but it has holes in the top, and that might compensate for the less light, and it's cheaper. So if, we, if that one actually works, and that, then we can put more of them in the landscape, because they don't cost as much. So the next thing is data sharing. We've all heard about that. We need resources and data, information, clearing houses where people can go get information. Adaptive management, we need to evolve our minds, have competitions, multidisciplinary input, landscape architects to devise overpasses that are, are non-traditional and maybe less expensive, but more fancy for the animals. Again, the traditional drainage culvert to the tunnel with holes in it to more durable fencing. Almost done. So we need guidelines, we need books, ID books for roadkill. A lot of people might know what a salamander looks like alive, but dead it could look entirely different. And you, only might, and you might have a, just a little scrap of it, so you have to figure out what that animal is. So we need these kind of guides. And we need road maintenance workers um, to have them on hand when they're out. They can collect so much data, okay? So best management practices, moving from the research, the guides, to policy. I talked about the sign policy with the MTO, with um, turtle signs, and they're gonna, they want to place signs for endangered species. Okay, best management practices. This is a small example. Maybe the rocky substrate in the culvert isn't the best. Um, retrofits, I talked about that Highway 24 study where there was eight dead turtles, add a fence, no more dead turtles, and now they're using the culvert to cross the road. Maybe not tarring the road at specific times of the year during nesting season. And that's it. <laughs> so I think I was, I think I was on time, I don't know.